What does Isaac Newton have to do with the quest for the Philosopher's Stone? Why would you baptize someone who's already dead? We all do strange things to make patterns of meaning in a maddening world. I'm Savannah Marquardt, the host of Ritual, a podcast about doing what's right. That's spelled R-I-T-E. Our season is told in ten parts and focuses on the quest for immortality and the ways we cope with our own expiration dates. The rituals we look at will span centuries and civilizations, and our exploration navigates all that space around and in between history, theology, and what it means to be human. I can't promise you any definitive answers about how to live forever, but I'll give you step-by-step instructions on how to properly bury a pharaoh. Don't try this at home. Or, or do. Tell me how it goes. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and at ritualpodcast.com. New episodes come out every Wednesday. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 55, The Dionysian Mysteries. In the last several episodes, we have discussed various aspects of ancient Greek daily life that fall under the dominion of Dionysus, from wine to the symposium to the theater. We also discussed a few of his major festivals, like the Anthesteria, the Dionysia, and the Linnea. Well, now we are going to finish up by looking at some of his more famous myths and his cultic iconography, as well as a discussion of Euripides' Bacchae, where the ritual madness and religious ecstasy of the rites of Dionysus were brought to the center stage. But first, we need to look at a particular Eastern deity who had a major influence on the cult of Dionysus, that being the great mother Sibylle. According to Greek myth, Sibylle was born from a great rock in Phrygia on Mount Ida possibly from one of the rocks that Deucalion and Pyrrha threw behind their backs in the flood story. However, although Sibylle was not innately a Greek deity, over time she would become one of the most popular divinities in all of antiquity. Originally, she was a native Anatolian mother goddess, and may have even been worshipped in some form at Katoholiak, one of the earliest Neolithic sites, not only in Asia Minor, but also the Near East. There, statues of sitting obese women have been found in excavations, which are believed to be a representation of her. Regardless, she is Phrygia's only known native goddess, and possibly its state deity. Over time, she came to be known by many different names. In her native Phrygia, Sibylle was known as Mater Kubalea, which means Mother of the Mountains. Although the Greeks sometimes called her Meter, which is Greek for Mother, they also shortened her name and simply called her Kibali or the anglicized Sibylle, which was basically a Greek adaptation for the Phrygian term for mountains. The Romans either called her Sibylle or Magna Mater, meaning Great Mother. The ancients also believed that Sibylle was the same goddess as the Hittite goddess Kubebe. That divinity, though, was quite different from Sibylle. Kubebe was a goddess that carried a mirror, emphasizing her beauty. In this same manner, Sibylle also has been closely connected to other eastern beauty goddesses, such as Asherah, a Semitic deity mentioned in the Hebrew Old Testament, Astarte, a Syrian deity, and other versions of Aphrodite, especially as manifested by Venus Erexina, meaning of Mount Eryx, one Sicily. This version derives from Aphrodite, who is connected to Astarte and Asherah, who is connected to Sibylle. All of these goddesses are intertwined in their attributes. Sibylle and Phrygia is about status and power, not beauty though. Sibylle also doesn't really carry out mother activities at first either, but she became a fiercely protective mother of any animal or child later by the Romans, and she has plenty of sexual energy as a goddess that gives life and vitality to wild creatures in nature. It was because of this that the Greeks also called her Potnia Theron, or Mistress of the Animals. 
It is believed that sometime in the 6th century BC, Sibylle was transported from the Central Asian minor region of Phrygia to the Ionian coastline, and those Greeks then spread her worship to the mainland. In fact, evidence points to an early focal center of the goddess's cult on the island of Samothrace. Although we do not have enough reliable information on the worship of Sibylle during the classical Greek period, her cult would become very popular in the Hellenistic and late Roman Republican periods. In Greece, she was partially assimilated with the various aspects of the Mother Earth goddess Gaia, as she represents the mysteriously constant life principle, or potency, that exists, unmoved at the center of the cycle of birth, growth, death, and renewal. But since she also was a personification of the Earth itself, naturally in worship and iconography, the ancients connected her with Rhea, Zeus's mother, and Demeter as well. As a goddess of permanent vitality, she could heal the sick and even resurrect the dead. She could give oracles, probably because she had a timeless quality about her. As a goddess of the earth, she not only promoted fertility in general, but she dominated and subdued wild nature to her commands, while her mountains, she is closely connected to Mount Ida in Phrygia, and natural defenses gave cities protection in times of war. Others too celebrated her as a foreign, exotic, mysterious goddess who arrives in a chariot drawn by two lions to the accompaniment of wild music, wine, and a disorderly ecstatic following. The few images and passages relating to the early worship of her cult in Greece hint that the goddess's cult image remained in her temple, not paraded about as in the later Roman version of the cult. In Phrygia, her places of worship were door-shaped niches carved into rocky cliffs and hillsides filled with high-relief images of the goddess. Worshippers approached her image with sacrificial gifts and the banging of metal objects. Perhaps this reflects her role as Rhea and recalls the mythical Corybantes who clashed their shields to cover an infant Zeus's cry on the cave in Crete, which was also called Mount Ida. A typical image shows her sitting on a throne as a ruler, either holding a bird of prey or flanked with lions at her feet, symbolizing her control of wild creatures. She wears a tall, turreted crown, which was thought by ancients to represent the mountains, since she is a goddess of the earth, and the mountains in particular. In her hand, she often holds an enormous drum, called the tympanon. A Homeric hymn to Sibylle from the 6th century BC reads, quote, She delights in the clangor of castanets and drums, the roar of flutes, the clamoring of wolves, and bright-eyed lions. End quote. Thus, we can see that her cult was filled with wild creatures, ecstatic worship, loss of control, loud music, uncivilized behavior, abandonment of reason, and dancing and shouting by the participants, all emphasizing the wild energy of nature. Although some of the Ionians, who first adopted her cult, continued the tradition of royal rock-cut sanctuaries, more often, her image was transferred later to the portable medium of stone votive reliefs and figurines, found not only in sanctuaries, but also in domestic contexts and tombs. During her cult's period of explosive growth in the late Archaic period, she was quickly incorporated into civic worship. In Athens, the emerging democracy seems to have welcomed this popular goddess by the end of the 6th century BC. Sibylle's cult was established in or near the Bulaterion, or council chamber, in the Agora, and Athenian council members began to sacrifice to the mother of the gods, along with the other major civic deities. In the late 5th century BC, with the construction of a new Bulaterion, the old one became known as the Matrun, or Temple of Meter, which was used as a state archive. Private sponsorship of Sibylle was also widespread and was prompted by dreams and visions. Pindar is said to have founded a Theban shrine of Sibylle after he had a vision of the goddess's statue walking, and Themistocles brought the cult to Magnesia after the goddess warned him in a dream of an assassination attempt. In the succeeding generation, however, the cult of Sibylle was viewed less favorably, at least by the elite men of Athens, and was associated with women and the poor, as well as excessive emotional displays. Although Sibylle was worshipped with great variety and in various manners, it doesn't seem likely, though, that the Greeks adopted some of the more frenzied aspects of her cult, at least not early on which included self-flagellation of the priests, whom the Phrygians called Galli. We are not sure why, but it is assumed that they were probably from Galatia, the region next to Phrygia. 
Her priests were eunuchs, who castrated themselves to show devotion to the goddess, and to make themselves more feminine, in a sense, like the goddess herself. Similarly, her devotees too dressed as girls, even if they were men, to emphasize effeminate behavior. Her priests would play drums, blow horns, and display the bloody knives, which they used to castrate themselves. Her cult became a haven for transsexuals and social misfits, because their behavior, which otherwise would have been seen as outrageous, was legitimized within her cult. Typically, Sibylle is seen with a concert, a little shepherd boy named Addis. Possibly a Greek creation, he does not become a prominent figure in her cult until the 4th century BC. When he does show up, Addis is often dressed in Trojan or Persian clothes, in essence representing an oriental nature boy. He is the ultimate worshipper and petitioner, and her major mythological narratives tend to involve him. At one point, Zeus saw Sibylle asleep on the rock of Mount Ida and approached her in a blaze of lust, as Zeus so often does with everyone in myth. She resisted him until he prematurely ejaculated his seed onto the rock. Because of the divine power and virility of Zeus's semen, the rock itself became pregnant and eventually gave birth to a son, Agdistus. His strength was so great that even the Olympian god shuddered at his power and fled before him. Furthermore, his bestial lust raged crazily and indiscriminately towards both sexes, so that the whole universe felt threatened by his presence. Finally, the gods turned to a relative newcomer to the pantheon, that being Dionysus, the god of wine. They had hoped that he could get Agdistus, good and drunk, and so Dionysus went to the fountain, where Agdistus was known to drink, and he poured in a powerful dose of undiluted wine. When Agdistus came to the fountain, he guzzled massive qualities of water without realizing that wine had been mixed in, and soon enough he passed out in a drunken stupor. Dionysus then made a noose of braided hair from his own head, and slipped one end over Agdistus's feet, and the other end he attached to his genitals. Eventually, Agdistus recovered from his drunkenness and awoke from his deep sleep. Naturally, he did what most people do first thing in the morning, and so as he stretched a long, lazy stretch, he ripped his own genitals from his body and screamed in agony as blood spurted onto the earth. From his spurted blood, a pomegranate tree miraculously began to grow. The story only becomes more bizarre. At some point, a certain girl named Nana, the daughter of a local king, walked by and stopped in amazement at the tree growing from the blood. She plucked a pomegranate from it, slipped the fruit into her dress, and soon found herself pregnant. Her father was disgraced, because naturally he didn't believe the whole pomegranate story, and so he locked her up in prison in the expectation that she would die from starvation. Sibylle, however, kept her alive with fruit and grain that she snuck to her in her prison cell. In time, Nana gave birth to a boy named Addis. Sibylle became fond of Addis because he was extremely handsome, while the castrated Agdistus became his hunting companion. As the years went by, another local king, by the name of Midas, arranged for Addis to marry his own daughter. This is the infamous Midas, that of the donkey ears and the golden touch, but those unfortunate events would come about much later. Anyways, Agdistus was furious that the boy had been taken from him, and on the wedding day, he showed up and drove all of the wedding guests mad. A man named Gallus grew so crazed that he sliced off his own genitals, while some of the girls cut off their own breasts. Addis went crazy too. He cursed Agdistus, then flung himself at the foot of a pine tree, and ripped off his own genitals. Sibylle then took up the organs of Addis, washed them, and buried them under the pine tree. From the blood grew violets, which adorned the tree. Meanwhile, Addis's would-be bride killed herself over his body, and Sibylle buried them in a common grave where an almond tree began to grow on the spot. The devastated Sibylle and Agdistus begged Zeus to return Attis to life, but he would only grant that Attis's body would not decay, that his hair continued to grow, and that he could move his little finger. There are variations of this bizarre story of the relationship between Sibylle and Attis, but the myths always have him dying in some way. Sibylle always makes sure that he isn't fully dead though, because Sibylle is the constant fertile life force that never dies. Addis can still move his little finger, and his hair still continues to grow, although he is dead and buried. From him grows the pine tree, a sexual and fertile symbol with its sappy cones. Other symbols for him are the pomegranate, 
whose insides looked just like male testicles, full of milky white substance and blood red juice, and thousands of little seeds, as well as the almond, whose inside is a nut inside of a shell. In fact, the Greek word for almond, amygdala, has the root agmatha, the same word used in medical terminology for testicles. The myth of Addis teaches us that the mother power stays steady. It's a constant power in nature, and Mother Sibylle is in control of that. But within her control, it operates in a cycle. Birth, growth, death, burial, and regeneration. And it was for this reason that she was seen as the mother of the gods. Many myths portray Dionysus as a divinity who comes from overseas and tries to impose his exotic, irrational brand of religion on the relatively rational cities of Greece. As a result, many scholars have suggested in the past that Dionysus was a syncretism of a local Greek nature deity and a more powerful god from Thrace or Phrygia, such as Sebasius. At the same time, his worship seems to be an amalgamation of the cults of the Phrygian Sibylle, who was likewise celebrated with ecstatic dancing, as well as Egyptian Osiris, a Chthonian vegetation god, who experienced dismemberment and resurrection. But the discovery of Dionysus' name on Linear B tablets from Pylos, as Diwanuso, shows that the god was known to the Bronze Age Greeks, and causes us to rethink his status as an outsider who imposed himself on Greek order. Although he was actually born in Greece, in the myths, it seems likely that the Greeks played up the otherness of Dionysus, precisely because of the ecstatic effects of his power. Dionysus was born from a relationship between Zeus and Semele, the gorgeous daughter of Cadmus, who was the king and founder of Thebes. We discussed Cadmus in episode 46. Anyways, the only mortal who knew of his weekly affair was Semele's nurse. So when Hera found out, as she always does, she disguised herself as the nurse and put her plan into motion to punish Semele. Disguised as the nurse, she convinced Semele that she should ask Zeus to make love to her as he does to Hera on Mount Olympus. And so, the next time that Zeus and Semele found themselves engaged in pre-coitus pillow talk, the braggadocious Zeus boasted that he would do anything for her, no matter what she insisted upon. And so she asked him to make love to her, in all of his glory, like he does to his wife Hera. Zeus immediately regretted his promise, and even though he tried to talk her out of it, he eventually gave her what she wished, since he gave her his word. Unfortunately, Zeus making love in all of his glory meant that thunderbolts and a ball of fire were released, since he was a god. The result was that Semele and her entire bedchamber were consumed. As she was burning up, a regretful Zeus saw that she was pregnant, and so he snatched the fetus out of her body and placed it into his inner thigh, so that Hera could not see it. Thick thighs save lives, I suppose, even if they are Zeus's thighs. Anyways, a few months later out popped a baby Dionysus. Since he was born out of the flame and out of the thigh, this might be the reason that Dionysus would receive the epithet Disotokos, or twice born. When Semele died, her sister spread the rumor that her relationship with Zeus was a lie intended to cover up the fact that she became pregnant to a random mortal, and that her death was punishment for the lie. As a result, the people of Thebes became convinced of this. King Cadmus, the founder of Thebes, had many other children, all of whom either had tragic endings themselves, or their children did. We just mentioned Semele and her ending. Polydorus was the great-grandfather of Oedipus, and we already know how that story turned out. Autono was the mother of Actaeon, who became so renowned in hunting that he accompanied Artemis in the woods. Once, however, he accidentally saw the goddess bathing, naked in some spring waters. She became furious and turned him into a deer, with the end result that he was attacked and ripped apart by his own hunting dogs. Agave was the mother of Pentheus, who would become the king of Thebes. Their comeuppance comes at the end of Euripides' back eye. Inno was married to Athamas, the king of nearby Orchomenos. She was the sister that Zeus gave the baby Dionysus to, in order to raise and hide him from Hera. She dressed the boy up as a girl, which is where he got his liking for effeminate things, later on. When Hera finally found him, in her anger she drove Ino and her husband mad. Ino ended up throwing one of her children into a cauldron of boiling water, while Athamas speared another, thinking that the child was a deer. In her madness, Aino jumped off of a cliff into the sea. 
The sea nymphs, out of pity, transformed her into a sea nymph herself, and one day she would rescue Odysseus after a shipwreck. Anyways, Zeus rescued the young Dionysus, whisking him away and turning him into a baby goat. He gave him to Hermes in order to take to the nymphs on Mount Nysa. This is where he gets his name Dionysus, because he is the god, or Dio, of Nysa. Mount Nysa is usually placed in Asia Minor, but another strong tradition also places it in Thrace, near Philippi. Either way, while there, he was taken under the wing and tutelage of Selenus, the son of either Hermes or Pan, depending on the source, who became a sort of foster father to Dionysus. Selenus was a half-horse and half-human creature, but he was different from the centaurs in that he was predominantly human. He did not have the lower body of a horse, but only the tail and ears, and so he stood upright with human legs. Eventually, though, Hera found Dionysus again, and she ripped him apart, scattering his remains all over the earth. The other gods came to his rescue once again, though, by finding all of the pieces and putting him back together. This time, however, when they reconstructed him, he was made anew as an immortal god, before he would have just been a mortal demigod. This could also be another reason to use the epithet twice born, as he was born both as a mortal demigod and as an immortal god. This, of course, was not known to the general public, and so from then on, many of the myths in regards to Dionysus involved the god traveling the world trying to convince the people of his divinity. He often disguised himself as one of his prophets, rather than showing his true self to the people that he was trying to convince. One of his most famous myths is relayed in the Homeric hymn to Dionysus. One day, he was on the island of Icaria, or Chios in some sources, both of which were famous for their wine. There, he attempted to hire some sailors for a ride to Naxos. The sailors turned out actually to be pirates from the Tyrrhenian Sea, who figured that any small boy trying to get onto a boat by himself must have hailed from wealthy parents. Therefore, they seized him, hoping to kidnap him and get a ransom, or to sell him into slavery. For this purpose, they steered off course and headed towards Asia, instead of the island of Naxos. Although he was a god, and could easily have escaped this situation, Dionysus allowed himself to be bound up. Some of the pirates even found him to be so handsome that they plotted to rape him. All except the steersmen, who realized that there was something special about the young boy. Dionysus, though, understood their intentions. Suddenly, in spite of a breeze at their backs, the ship came to a complete standstill. The sound of flutes filled the air, ivy twined itself about the masts, and the oars turned into snakes. Then, wild beasts appeared on the deck, including panthers, lions, and bears. The captain was eaten first by the lion. Witnessing this, the rest of the sailors immediately jumped into the sea but Dionysus wouldn't let them escape that easily, so he turned them into dolphins, which remains somewhat human-like to this day. The steersman who didn't harm him was spared. At any rate, Dionysus then sailed on to Naxos. There, he met his future wife, Ariadne, who was left behind by Theseus after his defeat of the Minotaur on Crete. Eventually, Dionysus discovered that his old schoolmaster and foster father, Selenus, had gone missing. The old man had been drinking, per usual, and had wandered away drunk. Eventually, he was found passed out in the Rose Garden of Midas. The Phrygian king recognized him and treated him hospitably, entertaining him for ten days and nights with politeness, while Selenus provided Midas and his friends with stories and songs. On the eleventh day, he brought Selenus back to Dionysus, who in return offered him his choice of whatever reward he desired. After mulling it over, Midas asked for the gift that whatever he might touch would be changed into gold. Dionysus consented, though he was sorry that Midas had not made a better choice. Midas, however, rejoiced in his new power, which he hastened to put to the test. He immediately touched and turned a gold, an oak twig, and a stone. Overjoyed, as soon as he arrived home, he ordered the servants to set a feast on the table to celebrate his new extraordinary powers, but he quickly found out that he hadn't thought his wish through because when he tried to eat or drink at the feast, the bread, meat, and wine all turned to gold. And so he began to starve from a lack of nourishment. When his daughter embraced him, she too turned to gold. A saddened and desperate Midas immediately strove to divest himself of his power, 
the so-called Midas touch, since he came to hate the gift that he had coveted. He prayed to Dionysus, begging to be delivered from his gift, which was actually a curse. Dionysus heard and consented, and so he told Midas to wash himself in the river Pactolus. Midas did as he was told, and when he touched the waters, the power passed on to them, and the river sands changed into gold. This was an ideological myth that explained why the sands of the Pactolus were rich in gold. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is powered by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Fantasy football fans, the wait is nearly over. Football season is back, which means FanDuel is back. FanDuel is one-week fantasy football, meaning that there are new contests starting every week, and you get to choose a new team each time. There are no lengthy drafts, and there are no busted seasons due to injuries. There's no season-long commitment either. FanDuel has lots of contests to choose from, starting at just $1. Just pick a contest, choose your team, and watch your score real-time. New users get a free entry into the NFL Sunday Million with over $1 million in cash prizes. Just visit FanDuel.com and sign up with the promo code ANCIENTGREASE. I'll also be doing a listener league, so you'll have the opportunity to play against me and other The History of Ancient Greece podcast listeners for bragging rights. To join, go to www.fanduel.com forward slash ancient Greece. Once again, you can sign up today by going to fanduel.com, click the join now button, and use the promo code ancient Greece. And then go to www.fanduel.com forward slash ancient Greece to join Ancient Greece's FanDuel League. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. The earliest cult images of Dionysus show a mature male, bearded and robed, but it is generally believed that from his time in Phrygia is where he adopted the oriental, effeminate costume that he is later often depicted wearing. He is shown as a beardless, androgynous youth, wearing a panther outfit or a pelt from a young deer. He has long, flowing golden hair, his cheeks are flush, and his features are round and soft. In terms of iconography, Ivy leaves sit upon his head, and in one hand he holds grapevines, and in the other a thyrsus, a pole with either ivy or a snake wrapping around it, and with a pine cone dripping with honey on top. Although the thyrsus was representative of the male phallus, paradoxically, Dionysus himself is rarely portrayed nude or in a state of sexual excitement. In fact, he remains detached from sexuality, except in the context of the sacred marriage to Ariadne. The Dionysic phallus, thus, does not signify male sexuality or masculinity per se, but the exuberant, animating force that makes arousal and procreation possible. Dionysus himself often is shown riding a leopard or a panther, or being drawn in a chariot, usually by other exotic beasts, such as lions or tigers. In addition to the grapevine and ivy plant, the fig tree was also sacred to Dionysus, and since he was a god of resurrection, he was strongly linked to the bull. It was also from the Phrygian god Sibylle that Dionysus learned many of his ecstatic rites, called orgia, from where we get the word orgy. In modern usage, an orgy is a sex party where guests freely engage in open and unrestrained sexual activity, or group sex. In terms of the Dionysian religion, orgia, too, are popularly thought to have involved sex. But while sexuality and fertility were cultic concerns, the primary goal of the orgia was to achieve an ecstatic union with the divine. Regardless, as a result of his connection to Sibylle, Dionysus' music and his rites were much crazier and louder than the calm, melodious music of Apollo. There were usually a wandering band of people, called a Theasos, who followed him on these journeys. A notorious consumer of wine, his former teacher Silenus accompanied him, but he was usually drunk and had to be carried by a donkey or supported by the satyrs. The satyrs were part goat, part man creatures, bearded with erect phalluses. These creatures were extremely lusty and were the personification of sexual drive. They especially lusted after Dionysus' other companions, the maenads, meaning the frenzied ones, who were the nymphs that reared him on Mount Nyssa. The maenads were more interested in dancing and whirling about in a frenzy to the sound of the aulus, and usually carried a thyrsus and a davlos, or a torch. Dionysus is also known as Bacchus, and the frenzy he induced is called Bacchae. 
all of the worshippers of Dionysus together are called the Bacchantes. Dionysus was particularly fond of Pan, who oftentimes was seen accompanying him on his adventures. Pan has the legs, horns, and beard of a goat, but the torso of a human. When the wood nymphs first saw him as a baby, they were struck with terror, from where we get the word panic. His genealogy is disputed amongst all the ancient sources, but he seems to have been the son of Hermes. He was famous for his sexual desire. At the Naples Archaeological Museum, there's a famous statue of Pan making love to a sheep. Naturally, he was worshipped as a patron of fertility, especially that of shepherds and hunters in rustic Arcadia, who all looked to Pan and his hypersexuality to increase their flock. One of the famous myths of Pan involves his invention of the Pan flute, that is the Syrinx, named after a forest nymph that the goat-legged god lusted after. In order to avoid being raped, she changed herself into a reed. When the wind blew against the reeds, it produced a melody that Pan enjoyed. He was still infatuated with her, and so he took the reeds, and from them he fashioned his flute. Henceforth, Pan was seldom seen without it, either playing it in the woods alone, or as part of Dionysus' merry-go band of revelers. It's no wonder that Dionysus' intoxicating ways led to his connection with the vine and the grape. In fact, as Dionysus traveled the world, introducing various cities and peoples to his divinity and his rites of worship, he rewarded those who received him kindly with the knowledge of the vine's cultivation. Anyone who refused to acknowledge his divine status suffered cruel punishment. In his mad wanderings, Dionysus journeyed as far east as India. Many received him there, but three powerful kings resisted him with their armies. In a furious battle, Dionysus, Selenus, the Saners, and the Maenads brought them to submission and introduced cultivation to the Indians. While there, Dionysus established many towns and left behind numerous monuments that would one day inspire Alexander the Great to try to surpass him. The god returned from the east in a glorious triumphal parade that made all of the gods and nations stop and take notice. The hardest spot the Dionysus had convincing the people of his divinity, though, was his own home Thebes. Complicating matters, his cousin, the young king Pentheus, declared a ban on the worship of Dionysus throughout Thebes. This is where Euripides' The Bacchae opens. Euripides' Dionysus is young and full of anger towards his mortal family, who not only refused to accept his divinity, but had spread nasty rumors about his mother. At the place start, Dionysus reveals in his opening soliloquy that he has returned, disguised as a stranger, to take revenge on the royal house of Cadmus. He says that when he arrived, to convince the people of Thebes of his divinity, the women met him with much resistance, despite the warnings of the blind prophet Tiresias. In response to their insolence to his mother's memory before and his divinity now, he reveals that he has driven the women of Thebes, including his aunt Agav, into an ecstatic frenzy sending them dancing and hunting on Mount Kitharone, where they observe his ritual festivities and partake in the revelry, much to the horror of their families. Dionysus explains that he will vindicate his mother by appearing before all of Thebes as a god, the son of Zeus, and establishing his permanent cult of followers. Dionysus then exits to go up into the mountains, and the chorus enters. They dance and sing, celebrating Dionysus and adding details of his birth and the Dionysian rites. Then the blind and elderly seer Tiresias appears. He knocks on the palace doors and calls for Cadmus, the founder and former king of Thebes. The two venerable old men are planning to join the revelry going on in the mountains when Cadmus' grandson and the current king Pentheus enters. Disgusted to find the two old men in festival dress, he scolds them and orders his soldiers to henceforth arrest anyone engaging in Dionysian worship. He blames the foreigner, whom he doesn't recognize as Dionysus in disguise, and orders him to be arrested too. The guards leave and quickly return with Dionysus. Pentheus begins to question him about the rights of Dionysus, showing both skepticism and an interest, but Dionysus answers with hidden meanings, while only hinting at the truth, which Pentheus cannot see. This begins to infuriate Pentheus. Then, a herdsman arrives from the top of Mount Kitharone, where he had been herding his grazing cattle. He reports that he found women on the mountain behaving strangely. He then describes all the strange behaviors that he saw. Some women were sleeping quietly, or drinking wine while listening to flute music. Some were going into the woods in pursuit of love. Some were putting snakes in their hair. Some were suckling wild wolves and gazelles. 
Some caused water, wine, or milk to spring up from the ground. And finally, one woman had honey oozing from her thyrsus. The herdsman then says that he and the shepherds had made a plan to capture one particular woman, that being Pentheus' mother, Agave. But when they jumped out of hiding to grab her, the tables were turned, and the women pursued after them. The men escaped, though, but their cattle were not so fortunate, as the women fell upon the animals, ripping them to shreds with their bare hands. After the women had consumed the raw meat, they turned their attention to two villages that were further down the mountain, which they plundered and hauled off their bronze and iron and even their babies. When the villagers attempted to fight back, the women drove them off using only their ceremonial fennel staffs. They then returned to the mountaintop and washed up, as snakes licked them clean. After hearing all of this, Pentheus wants to defeat and massacre the women with an armed force, but Dionysus, still in disguise, persuades him to forego this plan and instead convinces him that it would be better first to spy on them in order to gain more information on the situation. But he must do so in the disguise of a female maenad in order to avoid detection. Pentheus agrees, and Dionysus here is setting phase two of his revenge into motion. And so, he dresses Pentheus in his feminine-like fashion, giving him a thyrsus and covering him in fawn skins. Dionysus then leads him out of the house to the mountains. At this point, Pentheus appears not wholly sane, as he thinks he sees two suns in the sky, and believes he now has the strength to rip up the mountains with his bare hands. He also begins to see through Dionysus' mortal disguise, perceiving horns coming out of the god's head. After Dionysus and Pentheus exit, a messenger arrives to report that once they reach Mount Kitharon, Pentheus wanted to climb an evergreen tree to get a better view of what was taking place. So Dionysus used his divine powers to bend down the tall tree and place the king in its highest branches. Then, the stranger revealed himself as Dionysus and called out to his followers. He pointed out the man in the tree, which drove the maenads wild. While in their frenzied state, the women thought that he was an animal that has come into their midst. Led by Agav, the king's mother, they forced the trapped Pentheus down from the treetop, and just as they had done with the herdsmen's livestock, ripping off his limbs and head, they ferociously tore Pentheus' body into pieces with their bare hands. After the messenger has relayed this news, Agav arrives, carrying her son's head on a pike. In her possessed state, she believes that it is the head of a mountain lion, so when she proudly displays it to her father, Cadmus, she is confused when he does not delight in her trophy, and his face instead contorts in horror. Undeterred, Agav then calls out for Pentheus to come marvel at her feet, and to nail the head above the palace door, so that she can show it to all of Thebes. But at that point, Dionysus' possession begins to wear off, and as she recovers, she realizes the depths of the disaster that she has committed. As the play ends, Dionysus appears in all of his glory and pronounces the destruction of all of those who condemned him, as the royal family has been devastated and destroyed. Agav and her sisters are sent into exile, and Dionysus decrees that Cadmus and his wife Harmonia will be turned into snakes. Only the seer Teresius is spared. Dionysus then triumphantly ascends into the heavens. The Bacchae is an invaluable source of information about several elements of the Dionysic ritual. It has been the subject of widely varying interpretations regarding what the play as a whole means, or even what Euripides' intended moral to the story was. Regardless of his intents though, the extraordinary beauty and passion of the poetic choral descriptions indicate that the playwright at the very least knew what attracted those to be the followers of Dionysus and the vivid gruesomeness of the punishment of Pentheus suggests that he also may have understood what caused those to be troubled by the religion. In the Bacchae, there are two completely different versions of Dionysus. First, there is the god as he is described by the chorus, which is the god of wine and uninhibited joy and instinct. However, Dionysus also appears as a character on the stage, who has come for revenge and is deliberate, plotting, angry and vengeful. In the play's climatic plot construction, Dionysus as the protagonist instigates the unfolding action by simultaneously acting as the play's narrator, costume designer, choreographer, and artistic director in spinning the web that would ensnare Pentheus and Agave. In this play within a play, Dionysus, 
the god of the theater, stage directs the action. The Bakai also presents with impressive thoroughness the tragic conflict between the individual desires of behaving oneself according to the rules of civilized logic and the realm of uncivilized ecstasy. Like several of Euripides' other plays, the Bakai is concerned with two opposite sides of human nature, the rational and civilized side, which is represented by the character of Pentheus, and the passionate and instinctive side, which is represented by Dionysus. The latter is sensual, without analysis. It feels a connection between man and beast, and it is a potential source of divinity and spiritual power. And so the Bakai seems to be arguing that it is perilous to deny or ignore the human desire to experience this type of Dionysian experience. Those who are open to it will find spiritual power, and those who suppress or repress the desire in themselves or others will transform it into a destructive force. Dionysus' appearance is effeminate. It relates somehow to the power of nature, which he represents, and probably also the way in which he was worshipped. Some divinities are ethical in nature, that is, they concern themselves primarily with human endeavors, such as art or intellect, societal issues, and life stages, such as rites of passage and marriage. But Dionysus stands for the enviable vital force in nature, apparent in everything that is young, fruitful, and full of the energy of life. The Greeks noticed this power in nature and recognized that it was almost always sexual, aggressive, and loud. And so Dionysus manifests himself in humans in an emotional way, and the Greeks considered emotionalism a feminine quality, characterized by the loss of self-control, a sense of danger, and the presence of much noise and shrieking. In fact, his cult name Bacchus, used primarily as a way to invoke his presence, refers to the riotous, orgasmic uproar of his worship. In short, he is noisy Dionysus. Furthermore, he was often associated with the epithet Bromius, meaning thundering. It's not like Zeus the Thunderer, who controls the weather, but Dionysus Bromius can strike thunder into the heart of mankind by shaking them to their core. There's also Dendritus, meaning power of the tree, which relates to the sap that gives vitality to a tree. The epithet Lyaeus means releaser, because Dionysus releases us from conventional and social restraint. And Linnaeus means wine vat, referring to the power that the liquid fire in the grape has to change a person's state of mind. Phalloi were the symbol of Dionysus, relating to the vital sap of plants, and similarly to the vital sap of humans. And so his domain was not just the liquid of the grape, but the sap thrusting in the tree, the blood in the veins of animals, and the mysterious tides of the life of nature. Indeed, for the ancient Greeks, Dionysus was an irrepressible life force that gave humans energy. The devotion of the Dionysic cult was an attempt to tap into this life force, and his followers performed rituals for communion and transformation. The goal was to become enthused, or to get the god in them, literally as they believed, so that they could experience a refreshment of life. This was called ecstasis, literally a stepping out of oneself, from where we get the English word ecstasy. They did this by releasing endorphins that gave them a religious high. They drank wine while dancing and whirling in the mountainside in the cold night air, an act that was called the orabasia. There was also snake handling, because the element of danger helped to enhance the religious high that was needed in order to achieve Dionysus. Finally, they played the music that Dionysus learned from Sibylle while in Asia Minor, using castanets, the tympanum, the barbiton, and the aulus, which were all loud and piercing. All of these elements caused a very real psychological effect. The rituals were so crazed in order to release the animalistic tendencies that lie under human civilization. If we were civilized all of the time, then these tendencies would come through in perverted, destructive ways. This is what happened to Pentheus. He tries to resist Dionysus, and then he finds himself dressed as a female and torn apart. So the Dionysic cult channels these tendencies through a controlled religious event, curing the madness that festers in us all. There is more to his cult than just ecstasy, though. There is a culminating and bizarre act during these rituals, which we have alluded to already. When the participants had reached a frenzied state in the ritual, an animal, usually a rabbit, deer, or goat, was released by a priest into their midst. 
Although in their orgasmic state, they believed it came directly from Dionysus. Regardless, the revelers would surround it and perform the sparagmos, which is the tearing of the animal apart with their bare hands, like the Maenads did with Pentheus. Dionysus didn't want the traditional burnt sacrifice that's usually given to the other gods, but he wanted the act of the sparagmos. During the Omophagia, the revelers ate the raw flesh of the animal that they had just torn apart. In doing so, they would be communing with the god, believing that the animal was actually a transformed Dionysus himself. The ancients arguably were much more in tune with the need to upset the mundane and let it all hang out. The cult of Dionysus, in a sense, created a carnival effect, distorting the norm and making people appear bizarre and grotesque with the distorted mirrors. The gods' worship let people have a freedom of experience, and there was laughter and much exaggeration. There was abuse, masking and unmasking, and role reversal. The norms of society were called into question and even broken in his cult. The point was to shake someone out of the mundane and to come back with a renewal of life and a fresh perspective on the world. It is clear from the descriptions of his myths and cultic practices that Dionysus stands in sharp contrast to all of the other Olympian gods. He was born of a human mother, and his worship took place not in the traditional sanctuaries and temples that adorned the cities of Greece, but wherever the god and his merry band of revelers traveled. Instead of the normal kind of sacrifice and feasting, his followers engaged in violent, wild rituals that preferred the unexpected and perverted. While the rituals for the other gods involved roasting and eating meat, Dionysus wanted his worshippers to tear into raw flesh. The other gods demanded solemnity and respect in their worship, but Dionysus asked for unrestrained revelry. The unorthodox form of piety that he demanded appealed not just to men, as was the case with many other cults of Greece, but also to women and slaves. Regardless, in the myths, Dionysus was accepted by the other Olympians, except for Hera, who hated him since he was the love child of Zeus. However, he would eventually garner her good graces when he managed to persuade Hephaestus, with his wine and his kindness, to go up to Olympus and reconcile with his mother. And so she then agreed to accept Dionysus as a member of the family of Mount Olympus. Dionysus also has attracted a great deal of critical attention because of profound theology, analogous to certain Christian doctrines, can be extracted from his myths and cults in a way that is not true of the other Olympian gods. A suffering god, an ecstatic religious experience in which worshippers are united with the deity, the consumption of wine as part of the ritual, and the belief in the god's ability to offer salvation from death. All of these elements have contributed to theories that Dionysian religion was co-opted by Christianity, on the one hand, and attempts to recast the pagan Greeks as Christian precursors, on the other. More recently, the psychosocial dimensions of Dionysian religion have been extensively studied to reveal how the god offered temporary escape from the normal modes of being into alternative states, such as a hypnotic trance, masquerade or disguises, madness, and of course intoxication and how he subverted gender roles and other societal norms. These analyses are largely based on the portraits of Dionysian worship and Greek poetry and myth, above all else, the Bacchae of Euripides. While they provide a valuable description of the god's symbolic significance and cultural meaning, a study of Dionysus' cults and the historically attested behaviors associated with them yields a picture rather different from what myth and poetry lead us to expect. In practice, the worship of Dionysus was not truly subversive. Instead, it offered outlets for physical and emotional self-expression within socially acceptable contexts. Furthermore, Dionysian cultic practices were smoothly integrated into Greek civic systems of worship, with ecstatic and private components balanced by state-sponsored festivals and conventional sacrifices. Dionysus was not typically a state-sponsored deity though his festivals could become essential to civic identity, as they did in Athens. The archaeological remains of his sanctuaries and temples are not impressive, but their modesty contradicts his great popularity. With respect to ritual, the most commonly recurring concept is the epiphany or advent of Dionysus and his reception. The dithram, often on the theme of Dionysus' birth, was his characteristic hymn. Though the details of the process are unknown, it is clear that Greek tragedy and comedy arose in a ritual context from choral songs performed for Dionysus. 
Four festivals were held throughout the Athenian calendar year in honor of the god of wine, the Anthesteria, the city Dionysia, the royal Dionysia, and the Linnea, the details of which we have gone over in great detail in episodes 49, 50, and 54 respectively. In addition, the Panhellenic Sanctuary of Delphi, primarily dedicated to Apollo, welcomed the worship of Dionysus during the months of winter and early spring, when Apollo was said to be visiting the Hyperboreans, a race of giants who lived in the far north. The tragedians speak of the ecstatic worship of Dionysus, high on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. Here, the worshippers of Dionysus, known as the Thyades, are described as scaling the twin peaks above the Corachian cave, roving over the mountain with torches to light their way and wetting the rocks with sacrificial blood. The term Thyades is synonymous with Maenads, but was used specifically at Delphi. According to tradition, the nymph Thyia, whose name derives from the verb Thuane, or to sacrifice, was the first to sacrifice to Dionysus here and to celebrate orgies in his honor, and thus his followers received their names after her. No special altar or cult place is mentioned either on the mountain or in the sanctuary itself though, but by the 4th century BC, Dionysus and his followers were sculpted in the west pediment of Apollo's new temple. Like other main Attic festivals, this one took place every other winter, and so the Thyades must have experienced great dangers and discomforts on the cold, dark slopes of Mount Parnassus. Plutarch, who served as a priest at Delphi during the turn of the 1st century AD, writes that in his day, the Thyades once had to be rescued when they were caught on a snowstorm on Mount Parnassus. And Pausanias reports that he spoke with some Thyades from Attica, who joined with their Delphic counterparts every other year to perform mysterious rites for Dionysus. Likewise, an early spring festival, called the Agriania, is well attested amongst the Dorian Greeks and in Boeotia. The name seems to be related to the adjective agrios, meaning wild or savage, and the myths and rituals associated with this festival involve women who run wild under the influence of Dionysus. What distinguishes the Agriania from other traditions, though, is the role played by men who oppose and check the women's wildness, yet are themselves led by the priest of Dionysus. According to tradition, at Boeotian Orchomenos, the three daughters of Minyas were driven mad when they refused to participate in Dionysic dances. Tearing apart an infant in their care, they dashed outdoors, only to be chased away as murderers. And so, during the Agriania, women said to be descended from the minions were pursued by a sword-wielding priest of Dionysus, who was empowered to kill any woman that he caught. However, if his power was ever more than symbolic, it had lapsed by Plutarch's day. It reports that a priest named Zoilos actually killed a woman, and so he was deprived of the priesthood as a result. At Argos, the Agriania was held to honor Iphino, another victim of the Dionysian pursuit. Iphina was one of the three daughters of King Proetus, who was the uncle of Perseus. According to Hesiod, Proetus refused to accept the rites of Dionysus, and so the god caused his three daughters to fall into a murderous frenzy, much like he did at Thebes, and they were soon joined by the other women and girls of the city. With the strongest youths of the city, the Dionysic prophet Melampus pursued the women to Sicyon. He was able to purify them and bring them back to their wits, but not before Iphino died in the pursuit. And so, the Agriania, performed on a biennial basis like other main Attic rituals, enacted a dissolution of social order and gender norms, followed by a return to stability. The ritual segregation of men and women, not unusual in itself, was escalated into an overt opposition between raving women and pursuing men. The earliest attested version is the Homeric story of Thracian Lycurgus, who drove the nurses of raving Dionysus over the sacred plain of Nyssa, striking them with an ox goad while the god himself leapt fearfully into the sea and was received in the bosom of Thetis. King Perseus of Argos carried out a similar pursuit, killing the main attic Halii, or sea women, but ultimately honoring their tombs and founding a temple of Dionysus. All of these various myths probably arose from pursuit rituals, like those attested for the Agrionia. The tradition of Dionysus' birth at Thebes was very ancient, attested by both Homer and Hesiod. 
There, the god was called Dionysus Cadmius, because his sanctuary was located on the Acropolis, or the Cadmia. Considering the importance of Thebes in the history of the Dionysian cult, we know surprisingly few specifics about the rituals performed there. The existence of a main attic ritual conducted on Mount Kitharone, probably the Agrionia, can be deduced from the myth of Pentheus' pursuit of the main ads, as told in Euripides' Bacchae. As we have seen, the authority of Thebes in Dionysian matters was supported by the Delphic Oracle, and certain Theban cults were imitated by other cities. For example, the Pythia instructed the Corinthians to obtain the tree from which Pentheus was dragged and to, quote, worship it just like the god, end quote. Two images made of pine wood from Thebes were called Dionysus Lysias, or the Liberator, and Bacchios. Sicyon too had a statue of Dionysus Lysias, brought from Thebes at the behest of the oracle, and paired with a Bacchios. The sanctuary in Sicyon was located beside the theater, and one night each year, the citizens escorted the gods' two images to this Dionysion, while carrying torches and singing hymns. The Athenians practiced a similar ritual with respect to Dionysus Eleutherios, originally a Boeotian god, who was installed beside the theater at the beginning of every city Dionysia. And so this cult ritual can be traced ultimately to the sanctuary of Dionysus Lysias near the theater at Thebes. Now that we've covered the numerous aspects of Dionysus, including the symposium, the theater, and his mystery cult, we are going to shift our attention back to the physical realm and look at the evolution of statuary, vase painting, and temple building that took place in the early 5th century BC. First up, though, will be statuary. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 56, Classical Sculptures. Mm-hmm.